Good evening, everyone, uh, and good morning. Uh, I just wanted to thank, the, uh, I'm Mukul Pandya. I'm the former executive director and editor-in-chief of Knowledge at Wharton, and I'm so happy to be with all of you today. Uh, I'm also very, very grateful to all of you for taking the time, the day, the evening before your exams are about to begin for, for spending time with all of us. Uh, I'm grateful to be with you to, and join you all in learning from Raj Gupta. As you may have seen in the bios that were circulated before our talk, uh, he is the chairman of Aptiv, a supplier of auto parts and technology, uh, which is worth about $42 billion on the stock market. And he's also chair of Aventor, a manufacturer of specialty materials and equipment for the healthcare industry, which again, according to the Philadelphia Inquirer recently, the stock market these days values at $17 billion. In addition to his current roles at Aptiv and Aventor, Raj is the former chairman, CEO, and president of Roman Haas. And he has also served on the boards of DuPont, Hewlett Packard, Vanguard, and Tyco International. Uh, you've seen his bio already, but let me quote from a recent article published by the Boston Consulting Group, just to sum up uh, you know, what a special guest we have with us today. Uh, the article says, many executives have opinions about transformation, but only a few have succeeded in multiple transformation initiatives across a range of companies and industries. Raj Gupta is one of them. Over three decades, he has served as CEO, chair, and director at several companies undergoing transformations that unlocked significant value. He has a wealth of insights that CEOs, board, boards of directors, and chairs at other organizations can apply. Uh, and as you also know, he's also an IIT alumnus. And so I'm very happy to introduce Raj to you all today. Raj, thank you for your kindness and your generosity in spending Sunday morning with all of us this, today. Thank you. Well, thank you for that very generous introduction, Mukul. Thank you, Raj. Well, let, let's dive right in. And, and uh, since we uh, talked about your IIT days, I wonder if we could begin by talking about your time at IIT. What was your journey like? And what lessons did you learn while, while you were an IIT student that have served you for the rest of your life? Well, first of all, I'm happy to be with all of you, and I hope you found the next uh, hour or so useful and helpful. Uh, the one single lesson, if I think about, uh, I take away from my five years at IIT, in fact, five and a half, because last six months I was associate uh, lecturer at IIT teaching the same class that I, my, uh, I had just passed in operations research. But what I learned at IIT is to compete with the best of the best in a very diverse group. I, I think if there's one lesson that I got from there was this, just to give you a little bit of the background. So my father was a civil engineer from Rurki and you know he wanted one of his sons to become a mechanical engineer, another one to become an IAS officer, which is what parents do in India, right? And I was, I, was, I was nominated or destined to become the mechanical engineer, so I followed his advice. But it was the fascination of IIT and city of Bombay that brought me to IIT Bombay. And just, just one other dimension I want to share on that is, you know, I was a young boy from UP, and UP was not considered an elite state. It was considered a backward state in India. So one of the things I learned at IIT is how to survive and thrive when you're not considered an equal to others. And to me, that was a huge confidence builder that has served me well Mukul, over the years. I think those are the two things I take away from my time at IIT Bombay, five and a half years. Um, I'm, I'm so, so glad you mentioned your, your father because I remember that when we spoke a few years ago about your book, Eight Dollars and a Dream, which was published in 2016, you mentioned your parents as very important mentors in your life. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about how they shaped your values? Well, you know, my father, as I says, was a civil engineer, construction, so he's, he traveled a lot, but he was one of the most honest, genuine person I knew. And I was very fortunate to have a, had, a, had a mother 
was a college graduate in those days, which was almost non-existent. So she raised us, six of us, born over seven years between 44 to 1951. And what I learned from both my parents were some very fundamental values, which were not necessarily part of the prevailing culture in India. Obviously they emphasized education that was important. Hard work, yes. Honesty really was some of the very fundamental thing that my, I learned from my, my parents and humility of not getting full of yourself. And final thing I would say was respect everyone, not just people who are older than you, richer than you. I mean, the, across social class, whether they were serving you every day, cooking your meal or doing your gardening or cleaning your place. But what I learned from my parents is you have to treat everybody with respect. They are just, they happen to be where they are, but you are not entitled to treat them badly. And, and, I, and I think, you know, again, I would say in the American culture and living here, that, that training from my parents was so deep rooted for all six of us that really has helped me treat the world and everybody as an equal. And, you know, the last thing, which is part of the Hindu religion and so deeply rooted that work hard, do all the things you have to do, but accept the outcome as it happens. Yeah. You know, just accept it and move on. Yeah, those are those are great and enduring values. So thank you for sharing them with all of us. In addition to mentors, I think books play a very important role in shaping our outlook. And I'm curious about which books have meant the most to you over the years and why do you think they mattered so much? Well, you know, to me, reading and learning, not only from your experiences, but others is, a, is a, such an essential part. And I go back and think about the books I read or the stories I heard in my childhood were mostly about Hindu religion, history of India, over a long period of time, the freedom fight mm -hmm. and the stories about Gandhi, Nehru, Patel, and Bose. I mean, to me, I mean, if I think about things that have left a deep impression on me, what the, what the really the cultural history and, and all the things that happened in the Indian history. And as an adult, I would say, you know, I am much more of an avid reader, but only selective reader of the books. Mm. Uh, because most of the reading I do is on a weekly, monthly, daily basis. I probably spend two hours at least a day, you know, reading about Fortune Magazine, Economist, Business Week, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and World Affairs, New York Times. So a lot of those things. But the books that have really have had an impression on me over the last, say, 20, 30 years was Good to Great, mm. was really a very thoughtful book. I would say, uh, you know, the, the biography of Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson, which was really a touching story about, about what made him who, what he was. And another one recently I read was, How Will You Measure Your Life? Mm. That's from a professor who recently passed away, Clayton Christensen, yes. uh, who, who, who was one of the prominent business writers, but he wrote a book when he was suffering from cancer and looking back at his life of what mattered. And, you know, I have, I'm a big fan of uh, Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> I have probably read all his books from playing to Tipping Point to David and Goliath <laughs> and talking to strangers. I mean, this fascinating way he interprets uh, what the world is like. Uh, and, uh, and finally, I'm getting into audiobooks now that I have more time and I find it, you know, those I can listen to and stay current with, uh, with books wherever I am at given time of the day or whenever I find few minutes. So, so as I said, you know, I, I, I am not one who has read a lot of fictional stuff and things like that, but that's, that's me. <laughs> I, I was just about to do, remark that you didn't mention any fiction books. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I may have I read a few here and the there, but uh, you know, that, that hasn't been something that's kind of, Maybe that's what I should get into next. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, uh, so from books to, uh, let, let's come to your, your career and your tenure at, during your tenure, Roman Haas, which is a very famous company, it, you know, 
pioneer in the development of uh, plexiglass and you know innovations like that. It was transformed from a mid-sized chemical company into a much larger organization. And after 1997, you bought three companies in rapid succession. Uh, and the organization expanded from about 10,000 people to 23,000 people in the course of just a single quarter. And I wonder uh, when you think back, what leadership challenges did you face because of this expansion? And how did you establish your priorities about the two or three things that were the most important to be done in that context? Great question, Mokul. So maybe a little bit of history about what Roman Haas is. So Roman Haas was started by two German immigrants in 1909 in Philadelphia. And the other company, the parent company started in Germany in Darmstadt. And it was a technology-based company. And to just give you some idea, so innovation was at the core of this company and very good value system. And I would say, you know, we only had five CEOs over 100 years, history of the company. And wow. that tells you something as to how the company was managed and, and the consistency. But, you know, by 1997, 98, we realized that good part of our business was becoming commoditized. That means the Chinese and other competition was coming on strong. And there were some businesses we had where we did not have the critical scale. They were very profitable but we knew that this, that was not gonna form the future of the company. Having said it in 1997, 98, we were a company with 4 billion of revenue and $400 million of after-tax profit and one of the most valued company in our industry. But we recognize how the world is likely to change. And I think that is a real pivot. And I'll talk more about it when we talk a little bit about Active and Avantor is what leaders do with the collaboration with the board thinking about what the world is gonna look like, not what it looks like today. And so when I became CEO, we decided we need to change, needed to change. And one of the things which comes with big change is a big risk. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So over a period of six months from 90, late 1998 to early 99, we had a $4 billion company. We spent $6 billion to buy three companies in a very short order. Yeah. And four billion of it is debt and two billion of that is equity. And of course, as I said, nothing plays out exactly the way you think. And the world fell apart if some of you were probably too young to remember, maybe not even born, that the world was in crisis in 98, 99, the dot com crisis and the financial crisis. And, and, and I became CEO just around that time. And this is where I go back and say, you know, Mukuli asked the question is, how did I decide what's the most important thing that we needed to do to stabilize the company and, and really uh, create a future, compelling future? I think first thing, and that's become my deeper and deeper belief over time, is getting right people on the team is the number one priority because without that, nothing happens. And you alone are not gonna get it done. The second thing was to say, you know, we had no information. We had 64 different information systems because of these acquisitions. And we had information that was not timely, not accurate. So we said, we are going to invest money to really get state-of-the-art information system, ASAP, and we spent $300 million to get it done. The third thing we said is, we have to focus on two aspects of growth. Asia was just emerging, especially China and South Asia, India included. So we said that's an area we will not compromise, we'll continue to invest very aggressively. And final thing as I started was the theme of innovation, which is what made this company great. And that was one of the core skills that we had is to continue to invest in R&D. And you know, I think that really was, became the focus of the entire organization instead of doing 30 different things. We said, let's just focus for next two, three years in ex executing on these three, four fronts. And, and you know, part of it always is, and I'll come, keep coming back to you with my comments about how important it is to have transparency and, and, and trust yeah. with all your stakeholders. Right. And, and it requires honest communication with your employees, with your customers, 
with your investors, with your board. You do not want them to hear things indirectly or, or let them, you know, when things go bad, you have to be honest and straightforward. And I think building that trust and transparency was something that I learned during that period. And it helped me get, maintain my confidence for the investors and my board to keep me in that position. They could have fired me and said, you screwed it up, so you're out of here. To saying, you know, here's a man we can trust, he's doing the right thing. And they left me in the position and, 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 I, and I think the uh, final thing I would say, just maintaining a calm de demeanor. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things I've learned is people look at leaders, whether when in, under stress, are they panicking or are they staying calm and focused? And that's something I learned the hard way, you know, that uh, if I got in the elevator and they sort my head down, that means there's something not good coming up. So I, I kind of learned how to maintain my posture in good times and bad. So if you're like, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay, guys, and we'll be okay. <laughs> that's that was precious. I was so fascinated to hear you see what you did, because these days there's so much buzz about stakeholder uh, capitalism. You know, yeah. working for all stakeholders rather than just your shareholders. Uh, but you were already thinking along, thinking along those lines 20 years ago, which is wonderful. To you know, know that I give credit to my predecessor. You know, I mean, we called, he set in motion uh, 10 years before he was CEO before me, Larry Wilson, wonderful man, He's still a good friend of mine. And, you know, he said, we need to hear four voices at all times. It's the voice of the owner, it's the voice of the employees, is voice of the communities because we are operating chemical plants and we want to be sure that we are transparent with our communities so they feel safe because their families are working and they're living in that area. And the final thing was the voice of the customer. Right. And what we need to focus on is the only way we can serve our owners long-term is if we pay attention to those stakeholders. And let's continue to work in improving our performance and deliver results for all the stakeholders rather than just focus on return because return will come if we focus on those. It doesn't come by just saying, we're gonna increase the stock price. Right, well, it's very, very spot on uh, uh, outstanding advice. Now, you also oversaw Dow Chemicals acquisition of Roman House. <laughs> and I was wondering, what others can learn from the way you dealt with that situation. So if you could describe the situation and how you dealt with it, I think that would be a fun story for everyone to hear. Well, I'll give you a very brief abbreviated version of this. Okay. One of the most important things I learned Mukul out of that experience was never ever make an important decision under pressure or in a hurry. Because likelihood is whether it's a personal decision, professional decision, business, whatever it is, don't rush into making a decision because somebody is holding gun to your head or something you need to do tomorrow. And so for example, you know, when the family came to us and trust and said in November of 1997, that they want to diversify and they want full value for their investment. The first thing I did was to call my chairman of my board. And frankly, we took six months of deep study because we were a successful company. We felt our future could be independent. We are not just gonna give away our freedom for nothing. And, and we, the second thing we did, we said, we have to get the best advisors, investment bankers, lawyers, and communications expert. And you know, so we did a very intensive analysis. And as I said earlier, that this was a time period when the financial crisis was just beginning or brewing. And there was no certainty about how the world would operate. And, and, and I think uh, that that's really, we took the time, we decided we had the best advisors and we said, what's the fair value of this company if we execute our plan? And we said, it's at least 50 to 75% more than what we were trading at. And, and we basically got two companies, BASF and Dow Chemical to compete on all cash transaction, we said, we only want cash, we don't want anybody's paper. And we wrote a contract with the help of our advisors 
that the buyer could not walk away once they committed. It doesn't matter what happens to the world because we knew something bad could happen to the world. And frankly, had we not taken our time and had not been thoughtful, had not incorporated the advice, this deal would have failed and not executed like it happened in many, many cases. Things that were announced never come, came to conclusion. But the fact we did our homework, we took our time, and most equally important, I kept my board informed all the time. Yeah. Because see, what happens is when things fail, they'll say, I did not know about this. You didn't tell us about this. And the family, I yeah. kept them informed and, 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 and to make sure that they feel like they know exactly what we're doing and how we're doing it. And if the outcome is bad, they know why it was. And if the outcome is good, they know that uh, they were part of the process. Had we not, had I not done that, we not done that, I don't think this deal would have concluded because Dow Chemical wanted to back out of this uh, and tried every tactic. It was a friendly deal. It was not like a uh, unfriendly transaction, but you know they wanted to get out of it, but we were able to uh, push forward and, and, and uh, conclude it a little bit later, three months later than what we thought. But uh, I think that, that hard work and taking the time and making sure we kept everybody in the loop really helped pave the way to conclude, to reach the conclusion. That's great. Th thank you for sharing that. Again, very, very valuable lessons there. Uh, these days you are the chair of two companies, uh, Aptive and Aventor. Uh, how have both these companies been affected by the pandemic and even more, what opportunities do you see for each of them over the next few years? Again, a great question, Mukul, because that's the world we are living in today. The whole world is living, right? So let, let me talk about the common features that really the, every company has faced, but these two companies as well, as to what they focused on when this thing really came on them. First was making sure the employees were safe. Both companies, we said that is our number one priority that we take all the precautions to make sure everybody who comes to work is safe when they come to work. The second thing is, as we all know, how remote, including today's session, the remote. How do you make remote working reality and use the technology and have the uh, security systems and everything else to make things work in a remote, remote environment? The third thing we both, both did, you know, because what happened in the second quarter of last year, starting in February, the demand just fell apart. In case of automotive industry, production around the world just stopped, just literally stopped. And so there's no business to be had. So when you don't have a business for a while, you don't know how long will it last. You want to make sure that you have financial resources to write it out. Yeah. So we created credit lines, we issued some equity, uh, and we made sure that uh, we had the financial resources to write all this out. And again, uh, you know, the, the, during this period, and I keep repeating this, you know, the transparent and trustworthy open communication by the CEO, with the board, with the employees, with the investors, the frequency of our interaction and my interaction as chairman was multiplied five, tenfold compared to normal. But we were all on the same page talking to each other. So those were the common things, uh, and I would say this applies to everybody, but you know, you cannot just forget what you're dealing with the crisis. You have to think beyond crisis. And that's what leaders do. And you know, to give you a, a, two different perspectives because Aptiv was in automotive industry and we were positioning the company already to say, world is gonna move away from diesel and gasoline engines into electric vehicles and hybrids, you know, and autonomous driver-free driving, more safety, all the you know, in, infotainment in a different way. So we were already positioning the company. And what it did for us, we said, let's accelerate that. So let's invest even more in this while at the same time reducing the risk. The good news is the demand for automotive came back very quickly and frankly, Right now, we are all suffering from a huge disruption in the supply chain from semiconductors to plastics to everybody.
to make the cars and every car company is just stopping production for a week, two weeks, three months. And we hope it's temporary, but preparing, always anticipating the future and, and making sure you have the resources that you can ride through this crisis. And at the same time, you're thinking about the future. In case of Avantor, which is really in healthcare space, both as an equipment supplier, services supplier, and product supplier. You know, I mean, this one is a little different uh, outcome because healthcare has been, healthcare and technology have been on an upward trend during right. COVID for sure. good reasons, because everybody needed the technology and the cloud and everything else, and everybody needed healthcare with, and vaccines was a big tailwind for us in this case. So we are actually supplying every one of the three or four vaccines that have come out from Moderna or Pfizer or, 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 or AstraZeneca. We are involved with every one of them. So it was a tailwind for us. But having said it, we also faced the crisis in supply chain, yeah. making sure the workers could come in because we had to provide people and make sure the products were served on time. And so, so we had to you know, really be, and you know, then at the same time, just like after, we focused on how the world of medicine is going to evolve and change. And mm -hmm. I think the world is going to move toward personalized medicine, mm -hmm. gene and cell therapy rather than chemical ways of making things. So we have been really much more focused on the future of the industry about sustainability of vaccines, cell and gene therapy, uh, and, and, and personalized medicine as the future and we are preparing ourselves for that. So, so I think both those companies, I would say give credit to the CEO and the board of, uh, and having the support of the owners to say, yes, go for it. So I think that's hopefully it says, you know, how do you deal with crises and yet not lose sight of what you are there for. No, again, a very, very uh, uh, sound strategy on your part. And I think the valuations of both companies reflect uh, confidence uh, that, that uh, uh, investors have in what you're doing. Just have a couple of final questions uh, and, and like to go back to the, to the wonderful book you wrote uh, uh, about uh, you know, $8 in a dream. Uh, some of the parts that I enjoyed most uh, were about your family, especially your children. Uh, what are your deepest convictions or life lessons that you would like to pass on to your children and grandchildren to guide them on their journey? <laughs> so, you know, again, you know, life is evolution. So, you know, I mean, uh, I'm reflecting back of what uh, we did rather than what we planned to do. But, you know, I mean, some of the things I try to pass on to our two daughters, one of them is a civil rights lawyer, as you know, and nominated for Associate Attorney General of the United States. Another one is a professor at Hopkins in infectious diseases with a big project in India. I, I think, again, some of the things I learned from my parents, decency and respect, yeah. humility, honesty, hard work. But very important departure from what my parents told me, pursue your passion. Yeah. You know, pursue because you're going to spend most of your time either working or thinking about work. Pursue what you would love to do uh, and rather than follow what your dad did. So I learned that from telling my older daughter who was good in math and science, go become engineer and get an MBA and become a business person. And she was at MIT and after one year she said, dad, I'll finish it, but this is not me. And I, I, I let her do what she, she wanted to do. I think the other thing I try to tell them, balance your personal and professional life don't just get consumed by professional lives and at the, at the, at the cost of your family. It's very important. Uh, they need your support and you need their support. And final thing, you know, I try to do with my grandkids and my kids is take responsibility for your decisions and actions. Don't blame somebody else or circumstances why you didn't succeed. Be responsible, learn and move on. And maybe all this is common sense, Mipple, but I, I try to do this not by telling them what to do is hopefully they see, uh, you know, how, how Kamala and I have lived our life and try to do our best. And final thing I would say is give back, give back, give back 
to to people who are in need and the causes that you believe in. And we have tried in our retirement to really help with education and healthcare for the needy uh, through our foundation. Okay, uh, thank you for sharing those wonderful lessons. And I'll ask one last question and then turn it over to Achal so that the students, uh, he can present the students' questions. If yeah. you were an IIT student today, how would you prepare for a life that is not just successful professionally, but also purposeful and fulfilling? Yeah, well, you know, some of what sounds familiar because I just went through it. I, I would just encourage you to pursue your passion, not somebody else's expectations, you know, because you'll be happier longer term. The second thing I would say is find an organization and people who share your values. Yeah. Because whenever you work in an organization that is conflict at odds with what, how you want to live your life and how you want to work, you're not going to be happy and you're not going to realize your potential and you're not going to contribute as much. The third thing I would say, you know, it's not about me, it's about we. Yeah. And, and put the organization where you work because they, you are there because they want you to contribute to their success. And if you contribute to their success, you will be rewarded and recognized. It isn't about you taking, like, I'm the best, I need more, I need promotion, I need more money. If you take that attitude over time, I, I think you will not be as happy or successful. Uh, I would say also always think about contributing to the organization above and beyond the job you have at hand. But well, that's the only way you really get more opportunity. People see that this person really cares about us. He has ideas and we'll give him bigger opportunity. Because if you just do your job from nine to five, yeah, you're useful, but you know, you're not the one who is going to move up the organization. And, 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 and also, you know, try not to play politics. You know, I mean, the last thing you want to do is to undermine or criticize your colleagues and peers and, and, and think, you know, that you will be rewarded because you are positioning yourself and playing. playing. I, I, I certainly don't think that works. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, most important thing is to have fun, enjoy what you do, uh, take care of yourself and the family, and give, not just take. You know, I mean, if I simplify <laughs> My, my, my lessons, I think that's what I will tell the IIT students, uh, young, youngsters who are coming up the ranks. Thank you so much, Raj, for uh, sharing that, your, your wisdom and your, your perspective. I'll turn it over to Achal uh, to, to, so that the students' questions can come directly to you. Thank you. Thanks, Mughal. Um, yeah, we had uh, several students have submitted questions in advance uh, to us, uh, so I have quite a few of those that I'll uh, work through. Uh, those, for those of you who are uh, watching, there is an option to add uh, questions under the Q&A uh, section. So if you want to throw in any questions at this time, you can do that, and we'll try to pick up uh, a few from there as well. Uh, let me begin first with a question from Tanmay Gupta, who's an IIT Gandhi Nagar student. Uh, she has two of them. One is, how important were your degrees, uh, your bachelor's degrees, your master's degree, and your MBA in making you what you are? And the second question that she had is that if you had $8 and a dream now, uh, I guess I did the math, uh, I, I checked the, the economy, the, whatever the rates on this, and it would be $55 now, by the way. Uh, so if you had $5 <laughs> and a dream now, what would that dream be? Mm. Again, great, great question. So, you know, how did my degrees help me get to where we are? So to me, you know, the thing about $8 or $55 today has more to do, do you have fundamentals that can position you? Because frankly, without that education, I would not been able to come to United States and, and certainly not been able to do all the things I was able to do. But I do think it's an interesting question for a number of reasons. First, I was a mechanical engineer who really rose to become CEO of a high-tech chemical company. The second thing is, you know, I, I, I was on the board of a finance, world's large, one of the largest financial institutions, Vanguard Group, which manages six and a half trillion dollars for investors, which was a financial institution. Hewlett Packard, that was a technology company. 
Tyco that was a conglomerate, uh, Apte, which is an automotive company. And you would say, what does my experience have to do with any of this? To me, the engineering degree from IIT, uh, business degree and operations research, computer science degree from Cornell, all helped me kind of become more analytical, objective, and have broader perspective than a narrower perspective. So I was able, so, you know, for the expertise, whether you are a chemist or a chemical engineer or an electrical engineer or a te technical expert, that you can hire. And the leader's role is to take a bigger picture role and be able to recruit the best talent of experts that you can find. So I think, you know, to me, the broad base of education for me provided the foundation. And frankly, you know, my wife is a better mechanical electrical engineer than I am. She fixes everything in the house. She knows all the controls. I, I rely on her. So I, I'm almost sorry to say that, you know, I, I don't pretend to be an engineering expert, but that education was very, very fundamental for me in terms of uh, being able to get a broader perspective on business and, and life in general, which has helped me a lot to be a generalist. I don't consider myself as a specialist. I consider myself more of a generalist. Okay, here's another student, uh, question from a student uh, who says, in my perspective, leadership boils down to a number of good or bad decisions one makes. How do you decide how much time to invest in making a decision? Well, an, another great question, uh, and I hope you got some sense that every job I've tried to do is to say, what are the two, three, four most important things the organization and I should focus on at a given time? The dozens and dozens of things that organizations and companies have to do, but what are the three or four most important drivers? I have a very, one of my mentors was Ed Breen, who was CEO of Tyco and currently is CEO of, of, of uh, DuPont, both boards I've served with him. He was a great teacher. And he said, I look back at 30, 40 years of my career, I'll probably find maximum, maximum dozen decisions that I've made in 35, 40 years of my career that have been consequential. I mean, that says a lot. Here is somebody who has been immensely successful has an incredible track record. And he says he's only made 10 or 12 most important decisions in his life about business. And what it tells you is prioritizing, being able to see the big picture, prioritizing what's most important and consistently staying focused on those. And of course, pivoting. If you find that, you know, that something else has become more important, like COVID became very important, nobody had anticipated it a year ago, then obviously you, you change, but you don't lose sight of what, what's the most important thing. So prioritizing your own time, prioritizing the most important initiatives and continue to drive those through the organizations and communicating with all the stakeholders. So they hear a consistent message. They stay focused. I mean, you run an organization of 10, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 people, you cannot be communicating and directing them every day. And it's all about trying to prioritize so they don't lose sight of what's most important. That's, that's kind of my, my take on, on, on how important it is to prioritize your time as well as the organizations. Okay, another IT st uh, student question. When you look back to in, in your past, what is one thing you feel that you could have done better You know, I, I would say the thing, uh, as I said, I have been incredibly fortunate, honestly, because frankly, people who are my mentors believed in me more than I believed in myself and they kept making bets on me. That, that, that really, I mean, I never thought I, I, I would be where I am today. So all in all, I mean, it's been a, an amazingly uh, supportive role that my mentors played. But the one, the question you ask, that, that is a very important question is looking back, what I could have, should have done differently to become more effective. And that is honesty with the people. And why I say this is, especially when you are running a large organization, I think 
leader's role is to surround themselves with the best of the best, who share the value, core values. But also, another important decision that they have to make is if somebody does not is not delivering, does not share the value, to have the courage to confront them honestly. And that means giving them candid feedback, and if needed, getting them out of the organization. And frankly, if I look back and say what I could have done differently, I would have just trusted my instincts about people earlier and acted on my instincts much earlier than I did. Because at the end of the day, by delaying that decision, and I, I hate to play God in making decisions about people's lives, but by delaying that decision and not giving them honest feedback with disservice to them and a disservice to the organization. That is one thing if I were to do all over again, that's something I would, be, I would be much, much more proactive in doing. And in fact, we did that at Avantor when we recruited first two CEOs who weren't the right fit. And we landed with the third one three years later who has done a miraculous job. Great example of qualified people uh, ready to do the job, but they were not the right fit for the organization. So I think that to me is my biggest takeaway from my, my career. Uh, this question from Muzamil Rawut at Metfi. What were the biggest challenges you faced as a CEO and how did you overcome them? Well, some of, some of which I, I, I shared, you know, uh, first of all, I give credit uh, 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 for the courage that my board at Roman Hearts uh, really selected me. I mean, you know, you now obviously see 10 out of the top 500 companies, the leading tech companies are led by Indian American CEOs, but I was one of the very first ones and certainly the first one in the chemical industry. For my board to set a tone that we want the best person suitable for the job to be in this position. And you know, in those days, it was not an easy decision. So I give credit to my board and my predecessor saying, you know, Raj is the right person. That was one thing. I would also say that, you know, when I, we went through the crisis uh, of post acquisition of having huge amount of debt, uh, financial crisis and dot-com crisis and business started to fell apart. Uh, their their uh, confidence in me to say, here is a person we have assigned to do the job. We trust his judgment and we will stay supportive of him. They could have very well said, I, I think we had enough of you, Raj. You, you, you tried your best, but it wasn't good enough. But the fact they stuck with me uh, was another uh, element of courage on part of the board to say, we'll see it through. And you know, even today, uh, they are all friends of mine. I still am in touch with more than half of them and, and, and learn from them and share my ideas with them. And to me, you know, that, that's been an interesting journey looking back about uh, how do you build trust and confidence of, of people? And the only way I know is to be honest and candid and not just feed them good news, but also tell them when things are not going according to plan. And the second thing is not to be stuck in one way because world changes, environment changes, and be willing to pivot from one direction to other without really fear of being, thinking like, you know, you made a mistake. And, and, and I think those, those are things that really have been important for me looking back uh, on my career. We had a cluster of questions uh, around this subject and I'll pose them in two forms because I, it seems that this seems to be an issue that comes up uh, with some frequency. Uh, how can you differentiate a leader from a boss? Are they the same? And another one posed it in a different form. How do you get work from your subordinates without being bossy? <laughs> well, you know, first of all, there isn't one model for a leader. You know, leaders come in all shapes, sizes, uh, uh, language skills, and uh, so you cannot put leadership in one box. I, 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 I would say there is definitely a difference between a leader and a boss. And frankly, sometimes 
organizations need a boss more than a leader. And what I meant by that is sometimes, you know, when you are in a crisis mode, you really need a person who is decisive, has courage of the convictions, and is willing to pass the orders as opposed to just coalesce ideas and, and delegate and all of those things. Sometimes you need that. But if you are really there to play a sustainable game of value creation, you have to be a leader. And leader means, first of all, you are trustworthy, you are transparent, uh, you are uh, empath you have empath you empathize with others, not just demand, 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 and also listen, listen, listen. You know, I mean, so many times I've seen leaders who act like bosses or good people who, when they become senior executives or CEOs, just become overconfident or get feedback from their subordinates and outside world that they are the best. And as a result, they stop listening. Uh, they become a little bit more autocratic. And to me, listening, 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 especially in the world we are living in today, where the speed of change is a common factor. And, and that if you're not listening, you are not going to do the job. The history tells you a little bit, but history is not an indication of what the future is going to be like. And I don't think anybody is smart enough, I know, that can absorb all those things and, and, and uh, digest it and, and come up with an answer. So I, I think that's that's the thing. I was listening skills and leadership skills are, are, are very important. Having said it, as I said, there are times in the history of an organization where you do need a fairly directive boss. Uh, how how to, do you motivate your subordinates to give your best and solve yeah. small problems rather than annoying you for everything? I guess. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, mean, I, I remember listening to one of the folks who ran Chrysler a long time ago, DeLorean, who was an ex-Navy uh, guy, uh, and in, uh, uh, certainly in the armed services. And he said, you know, one of the things you learned in armed forces through the system was when you need to make, do the work, make your decisions yourself, when you need to consult your boss and when you need to get permission. The, the three, three different things, right? So the more clarity you can provide in the, first of all, you know, having these selected priorities at the global level keeps people to think about what's the important thing they need to focus on so that they don't lose sight of that. The second thing is you have enough guidelines in, for people to say where they should act on their own instead of being told. And when they know that they need advice or they need some direction to have the common sense and judgment to go to their boss and say, uh, you know, I've got these opportunities and ideas and, you know, here's how I'm thinking and can you help me, you know, uh, uh, give your, your advice. And the third scenario is that you know where your limits are, that you need a decision, you need direction you basically don't have the authority to make those decisions. And I would say that's a great analogy, even in largest of the organizations that, you know, you cannot have a company of thousands and thousands of employees getting directions from the top every day or from their bosses. It's setting that tone about what you are responsible for, you can act independently, where you need consultation and where you need permission. I, I think setting that hierarchy, and you know, it, it doesn't have to be in writing about what the guidelines are. The organization kind of develops its culture and sees people who are successful by using those common sense ideas and advance. I think it helps everybody else to understand what the rules of the game are in this organization. So I, I think that, that, that to me is, you know, creating that culture of both independence, consulting, and, and, and decision-making is an important element for a successful organization. Uh, here's a question from a student. I have a fear that by being ambitious, I may break relationships with people. I belong to a middle-class family by, where high ambition is not appreciated due to irrational fears. How do I cope with such anxiety and guilt? 
<laughs> this is something I lived with most of my life. You know, getting comfortable with yourself is very important. And, and clearly, the sooner you become comfortable, the better, more effective you will be. And, and what do I mean by that? You know, uh, and that's what I said, you know, if you're gonna be successful in large, large organizations, all about we than me, because if, if, and you know, this is something I still notice among, you know, many of the immigrants is they want to kind of project themselves as I'm the smartest person in the group, I work the hardest and hence I deserve the promotion. And when they don't get it, they get very frustrated and angry and, 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 and not realize that, you know, you get credit, people see through, you know, they know you are the smartest, you're the hardest worker. You don't have to advertise that. What you have to do is to coalesce them, listen to them, give them credit. And that's what the bosses will appreciate. That Raj is not just about himself. He cares about the organization. He is giving credit to others uh, rather than taking credit for, for himself. He is promoting smart people in his organization who share the values. You know, I mean, this is how you realize your ambition and be comfortable within yourself. You know, because you, you, it's very easy. I can see, you know, how you would have this anxiety because the expectations of, of others is, is, is different and you, you want to manage it. On the other hand, you want to be successful and live with yourself and, and, and you know, be happy. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's hard struggle. It really is. I mean, as I said, I think I, it took me a long time uh, uh, until I got, got to grips with this myself, you know, probably 15, 20 years. So it's, <laughs> So this, uh, this question is from Anshal Zabri from the Flower Corporation. He says, when a company is not doing well, it seems it has a lesser appetite for risk. Mm -hmm. How do companies make sure that they don't go into a cocoon where they don't want to take risk? I guess, and that applies, I suppose, even if they are doing well. Yeah, you know, that, that, that's another incredibly good question and a very relevant question. So, you know, I gave you an example of Roman Haas. We took risk when we were doing well, really. I mean, this was a company that was trading at the highest multiple, had $4 billion of revenue, $400 million of profit after tax and no debt. You would say, why the heck will you change that company? This seems like in a good path. And, and so, so, you know, taking risk when you are successful is probably a bigger challenge than taking a risk when your back is against the wall. And I always say, you know, the only two times individuals and organizations take risk, either their back is against the wall or they have a compelling vision of the future. And, you know, Tesla is a great example. Amazon is a great example of a vision of the future and driving it and coalescing the people. You know, in case of Delphi Automotive, that was a precursor of Aptiv, was a company that came out of General Motors, was in bankruptcy for five years, and essentially just went out of business and 150,000 people would have lost the job. And how we transformed it, first saved it, then transformed it. The key to this is whenever you make bold bets, you are increasing the risk for the organization and you are increasing the risk for the people who work there. So understanding number one, why are you taking that risk? Number two, how do you mitigate that risk if things don't go, don't go well? Because whenever you take risk, you know, there's no guarantee it's going to be successful. So this constant tracking about how are you doing relative to the risks you took and how are you going to mitigate if things go off track? is such an important dimension. Uh, and of course, you know, I've repeatedly said is communicating with the stakeholders honestly is part of that equation. But, but you know, the, the real, real test is when you take risk, you better know what those are. And if things don't work out, how do you mitigate the damage? 
Um, the question, does Indian education system prepare students for uh, leadership? What would your message or advice be for academic institutions in India to build leadership traits in its students? You know, again, again, a great, great question. Uh, only, you know, I, I, I think uh, soft, soft skills are much, much more important in leadership role than, than just the hard skills. And maybe our system is so much focused on the hard skills and technical skills, as opposed to teaching people soft skills. I talked a lot about coalescing the team, sharing the credit, uh, uh, and, and how do you prioritizing things. You know, so, so I, I think that, that that's what only suggestion I would have is to think as much about the softer skills uh, as part of the development and then just the, what I call the technical skills. Well, let me lead into the next question. What can a leader do to solve conflicts between team members, especially when a friend of the leader is involved in the conflict? <laughs> uh, I, I, I would say, you know, the, the, this goes back to being transparent and open. And, you know, because you really have to, frankly, you know, I mean, to me, the hardest thing, and my wife still reminds me, was to fire two of my dearest friends who were great colleagues. And when I became a boss, it was clear that they didn't measure up. And, and you know, I, I talked about that honesty with people and, 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 uh, and candor so that the organization sees you're not playing favorites. That is a very important skill for a leader, not to be seen as playing favorites. Yeah, I guess I'll make this my last question. You retired from Roman Haas in 2009. Now you are chairman of two companies. Uh, I assume you're financially comfortable and from anything I can guess from you, you are not, don't have an ambition to buy some island somewhere. So what is the motivator for you at this stage in your work? Uh, what motivates me today? I, I turned 75 in December last year. And uh, first of all, I find business fascinating. And I mentioned to you the speed of change in business is just dimension higher than what it used to be. And in that context, risk management, corporate governance is very key. And I, I was just so that, I mean, we have funded a governance institute in the name of myself and my wife at Drexel University. And Mukul is helping us with some of that. The second thing I would say is sharing what I'm doing today. I, I'm doing more of it than ever before at Harvard Business School, Wharton School, and Michigan State University, Drexel, just kind of sharing for whatever it's worth, whether it is worth or not, but at least people seek me out and I, I'm happy to share my experience. And the third thing really is giving back. As I said, you know, we created a foundation. We are half, half the contribution goes to American institutions and half of it goes to the institutions in India, giving back. And the final thing is just the time with my grandsons. I've got two nine-year-olds and one 12-year-old and they are the joy of our life. I was, around, I was raised by a strong mother, four strong sisters, and three strong women in my own family. To have final an equalization of gender in our family is one of the best things that's happened. So I think the, those are the things that, I've, I've, that sort of gives me joy today, it keeps me going. Actually, I guess since you were touched on that subject, let me pick up a question that uh, a student had raised and I thought we would be running out of time. Do you think leadership is more challenging for women in the workplace? Well, I mean, it, there's no question, okay? I mean, just like, you know, when I mentioned where, how my career unfolded and people took the courage to send me to France to work for five years in the early 80s and England for 10 years, you know, somebody has to make a bet. So yes, are there preconceived ideas? Yes. Having said it, I think the world is much more open today. And I would say, you know, don't, my only advice I have for all of you if you are, don't undermine yourself, okay? Stay 
with what your ambition is. Don't defeat yourself because it's so e so easy easy to do. And and I think that to me is the best advice. Can women rise up and succeed? Absolutely. Um. Thanks, Raj. Uh, it's been wonderful having you, and you have shared a lot of uh, relevant stories for our students, and I guess you were one of them uh, some decades ago, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so thank you, and I'll pass it on to Mukul to wrap it up for us. You know. Well, thank, uh, thank you so much. Great questions, and thanks for everybody's time. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, all, all I would say is thank you, Raj. You, you, you shared some wonderful uh, uh, nuggets of wisdom with all of us, and thanks to the students uh, for your excellent questions as well. And thank you all for the opportunity to learn thanks, from- Thanks, thanks very much. Enjoy thanks. your Sunday. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.